Yeah, you'll man the technology on Tongali. Dovi, let's start with the song.
Haravoda once again in another another year. Tishabov said over a little bit last night. How every year we always assume this is the last. But a Kaddish Baruch who runs the world, it's truly on a day like Tisha B'Av, we recognize that his cheshbonos, his calculations, and his master plan is often inconceivable and not understandable to our human minds. So if a Kaddish Baruch Hu needs us to still be mourning, and still be crying over one Tisha B'Av, then We're matzdik yasadin. We accept the decree of Hakadosh Baruch Hu. And if this is where we are, then Amir Hashem will do our avoda to maximize, and Amir Hashem to glean the deeper meaning of this heartbreaking and difficult day. I want to begin first by thanking everyone who dedicated the. Kinnis program this morning to thank Benjamin and Elise Wall from Eretz Yisrael, to thank Jack Bennett, to thank Jacob and Julie Blumenfeld for dedicating the Kinnis this morning in memory of Rachel Minkov, Zichron Livracha, whose yard site is Tisha B'Av, technically the 10th of Av. She was Nifteras on a year when it was a Nidcha. We hope that in the merit of our Tamutora that her neshama, together with all of the neshamas of Gidosh Eklan, Yisrael, and Yerat Hashem, have an aliyah, and their family in Nechama. Also just want to really give a very special thank you also to my Shea Abramson, who spent so much time just coordinating all of the logistics, and often gives up so much of his learning, and so much of his, of his moments of growth for the benefit of the greater Kehillah, Halavai, my Shea, we should be Zohar, and Yerat Hashem, your co-hosts and your talents shouldn't be used for things like Kinnis, but Amir Hashem should be used for Habatah's Torah for many years to come. Amen. So what we're going to do a little bit this morning, as is our minog, is to spend a little bit of time reciting the Kinnis, but also focusing a little bit on some deeper understanding, and of course also using it as an opportunity for Shira, for song, because sometimes we recognize that the power of shira is that often in song we could experience and we could feel things, we could even say things that often can't be properly conveyed and properly expressed in the spoken word. And to understand what our deeper avoda is for today, we have to take a step back and to understand the dynamic of this day. Tisha B'Av is a day where we mourn all loss. Everything we've lost over the last, the last 2,000 years, as a collective, as a community, as individuals, all of that is mourned on this day. But of course, the identity of the day was solidified and concretized in the destruction of the first and second Batei Mikdash. And so to really get to the neshama of Tisha B'Av, we have to understand what is it that we lost when we lost the Beis HaMikdash? Because everything, everything flows from there. I think for many of us, the hardest part of Tisha B'Av to relate to is the loss of a Beis HaMikdash. 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years we've been without a Beis HaMikdash. And so for us, often, that's the most difficult part. What, what, what am I mourning? I don't really feel a loss, which makes sense. You can't feel a sense of loss for something you never had. If you never had it, you can't feel like you lost it. Yet, all of the pain, and all of the difficulty, and all of the sadness, and all of the tears, trace itself to the loss of the Beis HaMikdash. See, even if I can't feel the pain over the loss of the Mikdash, I have to try to understand what did we lose? What is it that was lost with the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash? 
It can't be a building. Because buildings, building, you can listen carefully and you can hear, buildings could be built. Buildings could be built. Buildings could be taken down. Buildings could be rebuilt. A central location for Cloud Yisrael. True, but what is it that we lost? And I came across an incredible idea by the Maharal. In number one in your source packet. And just to understand how the packets are, are set up. The first part of the packets are sources. And the second part of the packet are the actual kinos that, that we're going to say. I apologize. I should, first of all, before I apologize, I should just a very special thank you to Mrs. Shani Topper and Mrs. Shani Bizwadi, who really spent an incredible amount of time organizing the packets, running off the packets, all the emails that went out. I apologize, some of the packets don't have page numbers. The page numbers are printed on top of the pages that do have page numbers. If you have a packet without page numbers, okay, I'll direct you to the right places. But in source number one on the packet, the Maral writes, he says, Ki be'emes ha'adam nikra eitz ha'soda. Man is called a tree of the field. Actually, Chumash and Dvarim, it's talking about a totally different context. The context that Torah is talking about is that when you go out to war, Torah says, speaking to the Jewish army, don't engage in wanton destruction. What becomes known as the prohibition of baltashris. You can't destroy things for no reason. You know, in, in, military, in military strategy, there's a concept called the scorched earth policy, where you just burn down everything. You burn down everything. Why would you engage in a scorched earth policy? Because what you're doing is you're hedging your bets a little bit. If you lose, you've deprived the enemy of meaningful resources. If you win, okay, you've deprived yourself also. But better to have your best. Kishbar who says, the Jewish army goes out to war, we go out to war to win. We don't go out to war to hedge our bets. So don't burn down everything, don't destroy everything, for you're depriving yourself of resources that you could use after victory. And the Lashon the Torah uses is, Ki Adam Sasada la is, is the tree an enemy combatant? Is the tree your enemy that you have to cut down the tree? That's how it's used. But in rabbinic literature, it's understood that Kia Adam Eitz Asada becomes a declarative statement. That man is so much like a tree. A man is so much like a tree. And on the most basic level, we understand that man has roots. A person comes from somewhere. A person has branches. He experiences, she experiences personalistic growth. And then there are peros, there are fruit. Whether those fruit be our biological offspring, or perhaps that fruit represents our Torah, our mitzvos, our units of dynamic accomplishment. Man is very much like a tree. But says the Maral something amazing. He says in number one, Ki nikra Man is really a tree. Look at the Maral, right? Rak. Shu'ilan hafuch. He says, man is an upside down tree. What does this mean? Kia eats sharsholamata takua ba'aretz. A tree. Where does a tree grow from? A tree grows from the earth. Its roots are embedded in the soil. Ve'ilu ha'adam sharsholamala. Man's roots are not below. Man's roots are from above. What an incredible image. Man is a tree, but he's an inverted tree. My roots are embedded in the heavens, and my tree grows out of Shamayim. He says, Ki anashama hu shoresh shalom. My neshama, my soul, like the Balatanya writes, which is chilek eloka mi ma'al mamish. My neshama, my soul, which is a spark of the divine, a spark of the ribono shal olam himself. It comes from shamayim, it comes from the heavens. That's my root. Vehim in shamayim. Vahayadayim in fan fe'ilan. So the Maral goes on and he explains, this is the tree of man. An inverted tree. And dear friends, 
when you understand this ma'aral, you gain a true window into the power and to the pain of Tisha B'av. What happened when the Beis Hamikdash was destroyed? What, what, what happened? And understand, we're going to see, you know, for, for those of us learning Daf Yomi, so we just did these Gemaras about the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash, destruction of Misham, we're going, to, we're going to revisit them today. But just understand that it wasn't just the Beis Hamikdash was destroyed. There were a million and a half people butchered in Yerushalayim Mirak Hodesh. A million and a half people. It was unspeakable atrocities. Barbaric behaviors, some of which we read about in Eicha. And what happened when that occurred? What happened when we saw the Beis Hamikdash go up in flames? What we saw were the roots were being severed. The roots were being severed. The roots were being severed. Now the truth is the roots are never actually severed. But there are times in life when it feels like the roots are being severed. It's not just about the death and it's not just about the destruction. But it's about wondering. Ribono shel olam. Do you love us anymore? You know, if you think back to childhood, every child, you know, has that moment where they're being punished by their parent. And the child, the child says, you know, mommy, daddy, you don't love me. Now, often children are just saying that to elicit a response because they know that's going to play on the heartstrings of the parent. But sometimes there is a moment where a child, because he or she lacks the comprehension, they say, you don't love me anymore. And the pain of Tisha B'av is wondering, Ibono Shalom, have you cut the roots? Have you cut the roots? We just sang in that beautiful song, Baruch Hu, we've never cut our roots to you, but sometimes it feels like maybe you've cut your roots to us. The pain of Tisha B'av says the Maharal is that the inverted upside down tree wonders have the roots been cut. A second piece to the power and the profundity over the loss of the Beis HaMikdash. In source number two, we know Torah Kedosha begins with Bereshes Bara Elokimes Hashemayim Be'asa'aret. In the beginning, HaKadosh Baruch Hu created. And Nashi HaKadosh and all of the commentaries wonder the same basic question, which is, which is, why does the Torah begin with the story of creation? No one understands it. You know, we, we could spit back which, what was created on each day. But no one understands the story of creation. What does it mean to create the Yishmayim for something from nothing? What does it mean, Va'aretz Haisa Sol Bavosha, that the universe was astonishingly empty? We don't understand these words. So the Mepharshim struggle to understand why do we begin with the story of creation if no one truly comprehends it? And the Sfarim explains so beautifully, based on the Medrash. Medrash Rabbah says in number three, Bishvil Reishis. Ba'ashem Tava Kaddish writes and he says, the Torah begins with the story of a beginning of creation because life is all about new beginnings. Chavra, isn't the most incredible thing in the world a new beginning? You know, tonight, Tisha B'Av is going to be over, right? You see, the good part about Tisha B'Av is that I know that in a couple of hours it's done. And how do you feel tonight? How do you feel tonight? There is, there's a certain feeling of elation. There's a certain feeling of elation. Okay, is it because I'm sitting down to eat? Maybe. The restrictions of the nine days are over. Maybe. Summer vacation could really begin. Maybe. But on a deeper, panemiastic level, the elation of Matzei Tishabov 
is because in my heart and in my soul, I wonder to myself, maybe this is the beginning of something new. Maybe when this fast is over, I wonder, maybe this is the end of mourning, and maybe this is the end of tsaris. Deep down, the simcha of Matzei Tisha B'av is the simcha of new beginning. Have you ever wonder, what was the simcha of going to the Beis HaMikdash? What was the simcha? What was the joy? I'm sure there are many different answers. Halavai will be Zolcha Meretz Hashem to not speculate, but to see it with her own eyes very soon. To see all of Klal Yisrael, can you imagine that scene? All of Klal Yisrael, all of Klal Yisrael, right? Not just the people who look like you, practice like you, and believe like you. But all of Klal Yisrael coming together in one place. Davening together in one place. But the Lashem Tav HaKadosh says the real simcha of the Beis HaMikdash was the simcha of new beginnings. Because imagine for just a moment, imagine you did something wrong and we all do something wrong. And what do you do? You bring your carbon chantos to the Beis HaMikdash. You hand it over to the Kohen. You stay there while he does the avoda, because after all, it's your carbon. You want to be there. He does the entire avoda. While the Kohen is doing the carbon, you do your v-doing and you walk out. And how do you feel when you walk out? Kipanim chadoshos ba'olakan. Imagine when you left the Beis HaMikdash, how light you must have felt. Imagine what it means to go to a place saddled with so much baggage, so much pain and so much failure, and then you walk in you do what you have to do, and you unload everything. And then you walk out. And you walk out feeling so fresh. You walk out feeling so holy. You walk out feeling so light. Bishvil Reishas. The beauty of the Beis HaMikdash was that it was the place of new beginnings. It was the place of do-overs. It was the place where whatever you had or hadn't done in life before didn't matter. You walked in one person and you walked out someone else. That was the power of the Beis HaMikdash. But now, we don't have our Mikdash. We don't have the first base Hamikdash, we don't have the second base Hamikdash and Rahman al Islam, we still don't have our third beautiful base Hamikdash. And on top of that, over the last two thousand years, how much we have suffered. How much pain and how much loss and how much heartbreak. And as a result of 2,000 years of pain, heartbreak, and loss, there's a new dynamic that's set in. A new dynamic. If you take a look at source number four, we say the beautiful phrase, Shira malos b'shuv Hashem ha'shiv ha'siyon ha'inu kichomim. Literally a song of a sense, when Hashem takes us back to Zion, we'll be like dreamers. It's a beautiful pasik. It's so beautiful that again, it's the capital we say before benching on Shabbos, Yom Tiv, joyous occasions. But what does it mean when we come back to Zion? We'll be like dreamers. And it's an interesting machlokis on the farsh, an interesting dispute. If you take a look at source number five, the Radak writes, Kichomim kilomar, Kichalom yaof yiye be'inenu tsaras hagalos me'irof hasimcha, Shetihi alanu b'shuvenu la'artsenu. The Radak says something amazing. What it means is like this. When Mashiach comes, when the Beis HaMikdash is rebuilt, what's going to happen with 2,000 years of suffering? What's going to happen? So the Radak says it's going to become like a dream. 
like a dream. You know, Chavu, we're going to talk about this over the course of the morning together. Part of the tragedy of suffering is not simply the fact that I suffer, but suffering trauma leaves its mark on the individual. I'm not the same person. So that even when the suffering is over, even when the trauma passes, the wounds are there. The scars are there. It doesn't go away. It stays with me. Ask any person who has endured loss and ask them when the hardest part of mourning is. And the hardest part of mourning is not the Levaya, it's not the funeral. And it's not Shiva, but it's actually getting up from Shiva. Because you know what happens when you get up from Shiva? I don't know what happens when you get up from Shiva. It's not a person when they get up from Shiva. Everything is done. Right? Ms. Askim comes, they take the chair, they take the Siddur, they take a little Aran Kodesh. Everybody else goes home. But what ends up happening is the rhythm of normal life begins for everyone else. But the mourner says, but my life is not normal. The hole in my heart is still just as pronounced, still just as real. Everyone else resumes the natural rhythm of life. But I, the other, am left here. Still so broken. What's true on a personal level is just as true on a national level as well. So we think to ourselves, Mashiach will come, Amir Hashem, the Karav Geula will come, and it's great, and everything's going to be fantastic. But the problem is, what about all of the pain? What about all of the trauma? What about everything that we endured? To which the Radak says, the Pasuk David HaMalach says, don't worry about it. The miracle of Geula is not just that the pain will cease. It's not just that Mashiach will be, the Yisamidus shall be rebuilt. The miracle of Geula is Hayinu Kicholmim. All of the pain will be like a dream. You ever have a really traumatic dream? Traumatic dream and it feels so real. And then you wake up. And you're like, whew, it was just a dream. And there's a certain feeling of elation knowing it wasn't real, it was just a dream. Says the Radak Davin Malach says, part of the miracle of redemption is not only will the pain cease, not only will the suffering come to an end, not only will Geula come, Bayinu Kechom, and all of the suffering will evaporate like it was a dream. It'll go away as if it didn't exist. The Malbim understands a little bit differently. The Malbim says in number six, Shira Malos, Husad Begalos Baba Ashiva Sion Vagola. Beshuva Shem, Shira Kos of Hainuke Homin, Beshuva Shem at Sivation, Azim is Hokino, Mitzion Tikvas Israel, She Male Hashem Hafta Hosso, I didn't view of the Hashiv Shivusan. The Malbim writes, what it actually means is the following. The Malbim says, is that it is our job, even now during Golos, to try to envision what Geula is going to be like. It's not enough just to experience Geula when Geula comes. But you have to begin to dream about it even now, even when you're in Galos, even when you're in a state of despair, even when you're in a state of suffering. Hayinu kichomim, let's begin to dream the dream together. But I think, perhaps for our purpose is today what this phrase also means is that sometimes when you're in the midst of suffering, redemption feels like a far-off dream. You know, the Gemara says that when you have a person, when someone has just experienced the loss, 
You're not allowed to give them divrei tanchumin. You're not allowed to give them words of consolation. It's the halacha. To put that in simple halacha lemaisa terms, when someone has just experienced a loss, you are not allowed to say to them, it's going to be okay. You're not allowed to say those words. Why? Not because they're not true. Of course it's true. It's going to be okay. No matter how traumatic the loss in life, somehow, someway, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us strength, He gives us resilience. It is somehow, someway going to be okay. But you're not allowed to say it because a person, the Avel, the mourner, is not able to hear it. Don't say that to me now. Because right now, I need to be fully focused on my loss. Right now, any thoughts of redemption, any thoughts that things are going to be okay, I know intellectually it's true. But right now, emotionally, cognitively, I can't hear it. But however, I think this is very much part of the dynamic of Tisha B'Av today. Do we know that things are going to be okay? Do we know? Of course we know. You know, we'll talk about so much this morning. But I mentioned last night already that we see what is happening in Eretz Yisrael. We see how the issue of judicial reform feels like it's tearing apart the fabric of society. It's hard to gauge, especially 6,000 miles away, because we only see and hear what the media shares with us. But certainly it feels that way. When a poll comes out, this was a staggering poll, that 28% of Israelis interviewed were contemplating relocating out of the country because of the heightened sense of divide. Who are the people being interviewed? I don't know. The numbers are correct, not correct. There's something that's scary for our people at this juncture. The sinaschinam that looks like it's once again rearing its ugly head is scary. Do we know that everything is going to be okay? Of course everything is going to be okay. It's the story of our people. But Tisha B'Av is the day where there is so much pain. Then Ayinu Kechomim, thoughts about Gula, thoughts about the future, feel so far off, feel so far away, that even though I know it's true, it's hard for me to wrap my head around it. Tisha B'Av is a disorienting day I want to share with you, and then we're going to go into Kinovav. Today we're going to be quoting a lot from the Kalav Rebbe. You could see his picture at the end of page one. Kalav Rebbe Rav Menachem Mendel Taub lived from 1923 to 2019. The Rebbe, Kalav is a Hungarian Hasidus. The Hungarian Jews were generally spared from the ravages of the war. The ravages. They were in forced labor, but they were spared from the concentration camps until 1944. To the end of the war, the Rebbe was deported to Auschwitz. And it was there that he was experimented on by Dr. Mengele. Yimach Shemov Zichra. The Rebbe didn't have a beard. The Rebbe never had children. And who could even imagine what this tzaddik underwent? Who could even imagine what this tzaddik underwent during that Gehenna of Auschwitz? The Rebbe, after the war, was dedicated to preserving not simply the memory of the Kedoshim, but the spiritual heroism 
which was exhibited during those years. And he wrote an incredible sefer, it's multi-volumes, called Shema Yisra. He quotes from it every, every year. And it's in this sefer that he records simple stories of spiritual heroism. Simple stories of regular people. I wanted to share with you one story like this. Just to help frame sometimes what it is that we feel over the course of Tisha B'Av. On page two, on page two, the story is called, Am I Dreaming? And this takes place in Hungary, in Budapest, after the war. The war was already over. This is already late in 1945. So the author of this story, Rabbi, De Rabbi David Ben Sion Klein writes, after five years in labor camps, I found myself going to the synagogue once again. I walked into the synagogue in Budapest on Shabbos afternoon. It was astonishing to see a whole crowd of Jews living as a community. It was so strange for me. I kept asking myself, is this real or only a dream? A boy turned to me and remarked that it was not permitted to carry things in the street because there was no Erev in the city. He asked me, don't you know it's Shabbos today? This struck me so deeply that I started crying. I thought, what has happened to me that others must remind me that it's Shabbos and carrying isn't permitted? I explained to the boy that I had just arrived in the city on the trains after years of suffering and terrible illness during the whole length of the war. A while later, I realized that what I had done had happened simply because of my exhausted and confused state. Certainly, I hadn't desecrated the day deliberately. Even on the train, I remembered to say the Shabbos prayers. The shul synagogue was packed when the rubber rose to deliver a shir and pirke of us. I stood in wonder at the sight. The thought kept going around and around in my head. Is this real or is it only a dream? Again, you have to just understand what is he seeing? He's seeing Jews in a shul, Jews davening, a rav getting up and giving a pirke of a shir. Is, is this real or is this a dream? After all those years, I had forgotten that there were such things as chairs and benches to sit on. I sat down on the floor to listen to the rav. Some people pointed out to me that there was room on a bench nearby. And I was obliged to explain to them that after so long in the camps, it hadn't occurred to me that one could sit anywhere other than on the floor. What an overwhelming window into the power of suffering. That even when it's over, even when it's done, it changes the whole orientation of a person. A man who walks into shul and doesn't assume that he could sit on a chair, he could sit on a bench. Where do I sit? Where do I sit? Well, where do you sit after years of being treated like an animal? You sit on the floor. Hayinu kechomnin. Tisha B'Av. 2,000 years of suffering fundamentally changes the way we look at the world. Everything becomes disorienting. It's not clear which way is up, which way is down. Do I sit on a chair? Do I sit on the floor? Such is the power of suffering. So as we enter into this day, we enter into the kinas, we begin to recite kinas together. It's important for us to have a frame of reference as to what it is that we mourn. We mourn the perception that our inverted roots have been cut. We mourn the lack of a place which gave us perpetual new beginnings. We mourn that our entire orientation to the world has changed. Just, just this, this, this orientation piece. What happens when Rahman al we hear about a terror attack in Eretz Yisrael. What happens? 
We hear about it, we read about it. And then something amazing occurs, which is we just go back to whatever it is that we were doing. You ever wonder about that dynamic? How does that happen? Precious neshamas have just been taken from us. And how is it that I go back to whatever it is that I was doing? And the answer is simple. It's not because we lack empathy. It's not because we lack love. It's not because we lack a feeling of achrayas. But 2,000 years of suffering have a disorienting experience on the individual. You know, everything is a little bit of a blur. Our Jews were killed. There's a part of me, it sounds crazy to say it, but there's a part of me that says, oh, I'm used to the concept that Jews are killed. It, it sounds crazy to say with my mouth, but it's the dynamic that often we operate with. The same way that this precious Yid in Budapest in 1945, Sit out, Jews sit on the floor. That, that, that's what we do. So 2,000 years of Gullahs have had a profound disorienting impact on the way we view the world, on the way we view ourselves, and on the way that we view the nature of the Jewish condition. That's what Tisha B'Av is. We've become changed in ways that we don't even realize. However, let's begin to say Kinavav. Kinavav can be found in the back of the packet. On page sorry, on page 21 in the back of the packet. Or if you're following along in Kinnis, Kinavav. Shava Surumani Shimuni Sakosa <laughs> Sam Subinov la Mosidonai, Sam Nasarta la Ramidonai, Sakami, Bime Bendinai, Sadiku Adonai, Hata, Kirinik Parata, Omeje Armonai, Kirafta Boy Live, Yahimuni, Karasi, Leo Shay, give on, Otem Zerumunai, Zermuni, Kuli Hashmiya, Barab Hagimuni, Kumi, Abori, Bahasel Harimuni. Krasinama by him or Rimuni Lama Rua Hapenu Tava Shamaru Raisi Ki Senar Auram Kamaru Raisa Kiama Bahas Bibuyah Kamaru Raf Tabiadi Haskan Kom Kiyomaru Rei Pinaki Dain Migoy Amaru Rayad Rakisar Di Mai Hamar Maru Hashi Venu Sisi Shman the Gai Sani Shift Tamrimos Hatel at Kaini Sif Sam Shore de Virdama Mula di Veni Shamati Zimuros Afe Hina Tatini Shah Bunadu Hatsas Labirini Labrini Shunta Honey B. Tom Hakta, the case of Anaha Toshi Langmo Kaz Hazos Honaha, Tirdof with Samo, you are Seat Sunaha Tidna, I have no safe in Neha Tikra, the Shakram Kos, Kamos Bifinaha Tavo Kara Sam the Panaha Tavo outside Sharki Lanu, Nimbo Hamas, Behaban the Halanu Ada Hadak, Behabar Iglanu, Sakin Bahar, Saka Balano, Ram Abahabet, Nam Hakulano, Skara Dono, and Mehayalano.
the words of this kina itself, the kina vav that we just read, shavas surumeni shimuni ovrai. The word shavas is everything came to a standstill. Everything stopped. And the incredible part of this kina, the incredible dynamic of this kina, is it almost sounds like Klal Yisrael lamenting how everything just occurs so quickly. When of course nothing could be further from the truth. There were generations of warnings, generations of Nevi'im, all who sought to help us avoid impending destruction. But yet, once again, the disorienting nature of tragedy and trauma is that no matter intellectually how much I knew beforehand, when it happens, Shavas, I can't believe this occurred. Everything occurred so quickly, everything came out of nowhere. The disorienting nature of Tisha B'av, the disorienting nature of our collective tragedy and trauma. I want to share with you something that I found incredibly amazing. Eli Wiesel, Zichron of the was an individual who dedicated his entire life to preserving the memory of the Kiddoshim, to ensuring that the world wouldn't forget what occurred to our people less than a century ago. And over the years, I'd always made it a point to read the writings of Wiesel's Zichron Levracha as he was able to portray the barbarity of what had occurred, not just in graphic detail, but in personalistic detail. And over the years, we've quoted from a number of his different books to help us connect with this tragedy that in the scope of Jewish history is still so close. So a number of months ago, actually Moshe's father-in-law, Dr. Chaim Haber, had given me a book. And he said to me, he said, I, I, he said, I think maybe you like Elie Wiesel. And he said, I found this book. He said, I'm sure you never heard of it. He was actually right. It's not a book, but it's a poem. A longer poem, a short story called The Tale of a Nigan. A Nigan is a song, Tale of a Nigan. And actually in the introduction to the book, the introduction is written by Elie Wiesel's son, Elisha. He says that his father wrote this short story, but it's not historical fiction. It actually occurred. And Elisha Wiesel says, I think it occurred in the town of Piotrkov. Piotrkov is the town where the Lao Mishpacha, of Israel Meir Lao, the former chief rabbi, the current chief rabbi of Tel Aviv. His father was the last Rav of Piotrkov. Piotrkov was a city of great leadership, great Torah. And Elisha Wiesel writes in the introduction that he thinks his father wrote this short story based on an event that occurred in Piotrkov. And I want to share with you this story. It was a little bit too long to put on the source sheet, but I just, it's, it's, a, it's, it's short, it's, it looks long, but it's just written like a, like a little bit on each page. But the power of the story is not simply what happened in Piotrkov. The power of the story is, as you'll see, is it captures the entire dynamic of Tisha B'av. Wiesel writes as follows. He says, a ghetto somewhere in the east during the rain of the night under skies of copper and fire. The leaders of the community, good people, all courageous, all fearing God and loving his law, came to see the rabbi who has cried and cried and has searched darkness for an answer with such passion that he can no longer see. It's urgent, they tell him. It's more than urgent. It's a matter of life or death. For some Jews and perhaps for all Jews, speak, says the rabbi, tell me, I wish not to be spared. 
This is what the enemy demands, says the oldest of old Jews to the rabbi who listens breathlessly. The enemy demands 10 Jews chosen by us and handed over to him before tomorrow evening. Tomorrow is Purim. And the enemy planning to avenge Haman's 10 sons. We'll hang 10 of our own, says the oldest of the old Jews. And asks the rabbi, and he asks, what are we to do, rabbi? Tell us what to do. So just so you understand, in the ghetto of Piotrkov, the Nazis Yemakshon Vizichram had demanded on Tainus Esther that the community had to select 10 Jews. Hand those Jews over to the Nazis Yemakshon Vizichram, and the rest will be spared. Come to the rub of the town, what should we do? We are afraid, says the oldest of the old Jews, afraid to make a decision, afraid to make the wrong decision. Help us, Rabbi, decide for us. And the rabbi, their guide, feels his knees weakening and blood rushing to his face. His chest is ready to burst. And the room is turning, turning. Turning around him, so is the earth, so are the skies. And soon he feels he will fall, as falls the blind man. He demands an answer, says the oldest of the old Jews. The enemy demands an answer. Tell us what it must be. Our duty is to guide just as our duty, just at your duty is to guide just as ours is to follow. What should we do or say? But the rabbi is silent. He dreams that he is dreaming, that he has heard nothing, lived nothing. He dreams, the rabbi, that he is someone else, someone else, living somewhere else, far away, outside walls, confronting other problems related to God and not to death. But the unhappy leaders of the unhappy community look at him and look at him with such force, such face, faith that he feels he must return and speak. Leave me, he says with a weak but gentle voice. I wish to be left alone. I must think to meditate. I must go to the source, explore the depth, and question the past. Come back later. I shall be waiting for you, I promise. Yes, I promise not to stay behind, not to be spared. Left to himself, the rabbi, breathing heavily, rises from his chair. He goes to his bookshelves to consult the Rambam who has foreseen all situations of all societies. His decisions are clear and precise, simple and human, humanly simple. And the Rambam, without hesitation, recites for him the immutable law of tradition. So harsh and so generous, so compassionate too. The Rambam writes, no community, even when besieged, may sacrifice one of its members, rather perish together than hand over to the enemy one of its children. The rabbi of the ghetto understands but refuses to accept. The law is beautiful, he says. The law is luminous, but here we deal not with ideas nor with beauty, but with destiny of a community, of a living community in Israel. And in Wiesel's short story, he has it, that the rav of this doomed community begins to actually talk with all of the great rabbinic leaders of previous generations. And the Rambam answers with sadness, I understand you are allowed to question and even refute my judgment, though it is based on justice and law. And you are allowed to expect another answer, a more humane solution. But brother in Israel, brother in Torah, understand me too. I have not foreseen I could not foresee your predicament, your tragedy. No unfortunate rabbi, no poor brother of mine, I, Moshe of Maimon, can be of no help to you or yours. So obstinate and tenacious, the rabbi of the ghetto turns towards other teachers, some older and some younger than the Rambam, who knew much about Jewish suffering, but not enough about the cruelty of the enemy. He turns towards the sages of Babylon and Yavne, the legislators of B'nai Brak and Fez, the codifiers of France and Spain, and sadly, they all shake their heads. Rabbi, poor Rabbi, 
pro brother and colleague, if he, our teacher and guide, Moshe ben Maimon, if he cannot help you, then how can we? And yet, rejecting resignation, the rabbi in the ghetto goes from one to another, asking again and again his burning question. You have taught me so much, but not enough. You have not told me whether I am to send 10 Jews to the gallows so as to save a thousand. Whether I, am to, whether I am to condemn them all and let them all be massacred so as to save Jewish honor, so as to save the Jewish soul which cannot die. Where is the truth, Rashi? Where is the justice, Rabbi Nutam? What is the way, Rabbi Sajya? Which is the way leading to Torah and salvation all at the same time? And he goes on, story goes on with this young rabbi consulting Talmud Chacham after Talmud Chacham throughout all the ages and each of them telling him, we have no frame of reference for your question. We cannot answer. And so, story goes on. From book to book and from century to century, from guide to guide, the rabbi comes to the best, the Baal Shem Tav HaKadosh, the most magnificent, the most human, the most brotherly of sages and teachers. And he breaks into sobs. Israel, Rabbi Yisrael Baal of Israel, he says, Israel, son of Sarah, Yisrael ben Sarah, you who consoled so many communities in distress, console us too. You who accompanied so many miracles for so many people, intercede on our behalf. I do not ask you to defeat the enemy, nor even to revoke the decree. All I ask of you is to help me find the solution. And if you know the solution, share it with me, for I do not know it. All I know, this is the rabbi speaking, all I know is that there is night around me and in me. And I am sinking, drawn by its silence, which is God's too. And the Baal faithful to his legend, puts his arm around the rabbi's shoulder and smiles at him. And rather than talk, begins to sing to him a wondrous niggin, a niggin without words. A niggin that neither the Baal Shem Tov nor anyone else has ever sung before. A niggin that confers hidden powers and privileges that even angels and seraphim do not possess. He sings, the Baal Shem Tov sings and his face is shining. He is so sure that with this song, he will be able to break the chains of evil and malediction. But woe unto him, and woe unto us. His nigin is but a song of weakness, a cry for help and not a weapon. I know why this is so, says the best to the rabbi of the ghetto. I know why my powers have left me. I know why. Because my heart is heavy with pain, too much pain. And God dwells in joy, in joy alone. Help me, young brother. Aren't you a rabbi in Israel the way I was? Help me drive the sadness away and you will see. You will see what can be accomplished with joy. Help me bring joy into my heart. But the rabbi in the ghetto, overcome by sadness, is overcome, is unable to help the best. Well then, says the best, then I shall do it alone. Let us start from the beginning. I want to be joyous, exuberant. I want to sing in ecstasy and dance and dance with all my being. Shout my happiness of being Jewish, of being God's creature, participating in his work and occupying his thought. I want to open the gates of joy and make it flood the world below and the world above. And then the murder will be stopped and the murder averted. He tries the Baal Shem Tov. Oh yes, he tries hard. He sings and dances with all of his strength. But at the end of the day, he is unable to intercede. Then the best, his gaze extinguished, admits his failure. Forgive me, my young brother. You are so near yet so far. Forgive me. I am unable to help you. Someone does not want me to help you. Am I then to give up, shouts the rabbi in the ghetto? No, says the Baal Shem Tov. I must give up, not you. Be stronger than I am.
because you are more needed than I. Nearing despair, the rabbi knocks at the gates of the Baal Shem Tov's neighbor and friendly rival, Rabbi Elio, the Vilna Gon. The Baal Shem Tov can't help, so the Rav goes to the Vilna Gon. <laughs> Rabbi Elio, he says, you help me. My community has appointed me its judge and I am helpless. And so the Gon, Elio, the Vilna Gon, closes his books, breaks his isolation, and looks at the rabbi. The light in his eyes is the same as that which enveloped Sinai long ago. Who are you, he asks. I am a rabbi. Where do you come from? To what book do you belong? I live in a ghetto, says the rabbi. And I have a question which no one is ready or able to answer. Perhaps this is a question to which there is no answer. Impossible, says the Gon of Vilna. All questions have answers. Have you looked well? Have you consulted the proper sources? Have you studied the post scheme and their rulings? Have you scrutinized the right text and found nothing? No sign, no hint? No? Well, let us see. And of course, now the rabbi gives over the question to the Vilna Gon. And the Vilna Gon says, Ten names, you said? The enemy demands ten names, right? Yes, I see. Wait. I see what is to be done. Wait. Here is the answer. Take it. And the Gon Elio Vilna, the Vilna Gon, hands him a piece of paper. The rabbi of the ghetto takes it and reads it incredulous and reads it again and again. One name, always the same name, written ten times, Elio, Elio, Elio Vilna, ten times as it is written. His own name, ten times. The Vilna Gon was telling the Rav, the only answer to this is for you to offer yourself up. Go to the Nazis in Machsham Bezichram and advocate on behalf of your flock and tell them to take you instead of them. Sh Shattered and moved, the rabbi whispers, thank you. Thank you for showing me the way. Now the rabbi is happy. Almost happy. He finally has an Eitzah. The Rambam wouldn't tell him what to do. The Postkim couldn't tell him what to do. The Bashem Tev couldn't tell him what to do, but the Vilna Gon told him what he had to do. But suddenly, suddenly he hears someone calling him with a caressing voice. It's Levi. He says, I do not like that solution, said the Berdichev Rebbe. It pushes you into solitude, and this displeases me. A Jew is never alone. You ought to know that. And even when he dies, he does not die alone. Self-sacrifice is not the answer, my young brother and peer. When a Jew thinks he is lost, he must find himself within the community of Israel. It must be strengthened by him and not divided. If the enemy wishes to kill, let him kill, and do not tell him whom to kill. Your role, my young brother and colleague, the role of a rabbi, is to be with his Jews, not facing them, should they be summoned by God or the enemy. Should they choose to respond, do as they do, walk with them, pray with them or for them, howl with them. Weep as they weep, share their anguish and their anger as you have shared their joy. See to it. See the sacrifice imposed by the enemy unites his victims instead of separating them. As rabbi, there is only one call you must issue. Jews stay together. Jews stay together as Jews. Vilna Gon telling him that he has to sacrifice himself up. Rabbi Yitzhak of coming in and saying, no. Whatever the fate of the community is going to be, we go to it together. And so, 
The next morning, the rabbi receives the eldest of the ghetto and solemnly informs him of his decision. The enemy will kill, but his victims will not be our victims. We shall remain together, and together we shall confront the enemy as one person linked by the same breath. A few hours later, the word goes around the six streets of the ghetto, somewhere in the east under the hostile and cruel skies. And shortly before dusk, at the hour when, the other side, when on the other side, Jews everywhere gather in their houses of study and prayer, recite with gratitude miraculous events surrounding Mordechai and Esther. And their Jewish friends and the enemy divides the inhabitants of the ghetto into the court, drives the enemy's inhabitants into the courtyard of the old synagogue, where the oldest of the Jews is ordered to make his decision known. Who are the ten martyrs? Who shall live and who shall die? Taking one step forward, showing no fear, his entire being reflected in dignity, the oldest of the Jews declares firmly, none of us deserves more than the other to live or to die. He waits a moment, a long moment, as though he wanted to add an explanation, but changes his mind. He takes one step backward and is always surrounded by friends and allies. Is the enemy disappointed? Impossible to tell. He moves his sleepy gaze over the inhabitants of the ghetto, young and old, learned and not, men and women, children and their teachers are all here. Is the enemy satisfied that no one is missing? Impossible to tell. He looks at his victims and says simply and coldly, in one hour, exactly one hour, you will all be dead. And all the Jews in a single movement turn towards their rabbi as though to ask for confirmation. Is it true? Is it a dream? Perhaps a nightmare, a farce, some cry, others smile, staring into emptiness. Let us be ready, says the rabbi. He does not say ready for what everyone knows. Let us recite the vidui all together, says the rabbi, and then Shema Yisrael all together. Let the Almighty hear our appeal. Perhaps he doesn't know what is happening here below. Therefore, my friends, my brothers, we shall sing loudly, louder and louder. Do you hear me? We shall sing so loud that our song will fill heaven and earth. Some look at him but don't understand. Others understand but do not dare look at him. There are those who wonder, sing? You want us to sing, Rabbi, here, now? Yes, now, commands the Rabbi. I want you to sing now. I'm going to teach you a song, a niggin, which I've already learned today, a niggin meant for this day. And he begins to teach them the niggin that the Baal Shem Tov, with his desperate fervor, had sung for him hours earlier. And suddenly, however, this is how the story ends. The rabbi notices with joy mixed with anguish that the community is own is larger than he had thought. From everywhere, Jews have come to join it. From Babylon and Spain, from Provence and Morocco, they have left the Talmud to come here. They have left the Tulsas to come here. They have left history and legend to be here, present at this upheaval of history. They have left their resting places to come to this ghetto to sing and dream with Jews who are willing to walk to their death. Rabbi Akiva and his disciples, Bar Kokhva and his warriors, the sages and the rebels, the beggars and the princes, the Holy Ari and his companions, the Magid and his disciples, and the Gona of Vilna. Strange, he sings, the Gona, Gona of Vilna singing, he sings the Bashem of Znigin, as does the entire community, as does the Bashem himself. 
while weeping and dancing and celebrating the Jew's loyalty to his people and to his song. The enemy begins the massacre, but the Nigan escapes him. The slaughterer slaughters, but his victims, one minute before their death, aspire to immortality and achieve it. With their song, which does not, cannot weaken, cannot die, it continues and will continue until the end of time and beyond. There's a great unifier in suffering and the knowledge that when we suffer and when we feel pain, that the Nishamas who came before us unite in that pain, join us in that pain. And the irony is that often suffering and loss is so isolating. The mourner feels all alone. But on a today, like today, or if you'll overcome with sadness and suffering, even on a day when we are not permitted to greet each other, Sheila Shalom is prohibited. But with all of that, with all of that, we feel a sense of connection, knowing that we are here together, knowing that we are with the Jews of Piotrkov. You know, I'll tell you, just one of the things I always wonder about and always think about, and for some reason it's always during Kabbalah Shabbos, is, you know, Mashiach comes, there's going to be Tchiyaz Mason. The dead come back to life. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu is HaYehovah V'yiyah. He's past, present, and future. Rabbi Soloveitchik, Sechri Tzadik, Levracha calls this the unitive time consciousness. HaKadosh Baruch Hu exists on all levels of time, all at the same time. And Mashiach comes and everyone comes back. <coughs> How are they going to come back? What stage of life do they come back? And I often wonder, obviously none of us know how it's going to be, but can you imagine Mashiach comes, maybe what happens is that these moments of pain and tragedy are frozen. Imagine Mashiach comes right as the Jews of Piotrkov are about to be murdered on Tainus Esther. Because Baruch Hu exists on all levels of time, all at the same time. And imagine the simcha of being able to dry their tears and tell them it's going to be okay, not as an aspiration, but literally as reflective of reality. Imagine if Mashiach comes and disrupts that entire flow of time, that the tragedies that occurred maybe don't have to occur. Imagine Mashiach comes and on some level of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's unitive time consciousness, that means that there are Jews still in line for the crematoria at Auschwitz. And imagine being able to run over to those Jews and say, it's okay, it's okay. Change your clothing, dry your tears. What you thought is going to happen is not going to happen. Who knows, maybe it'll happen that way. And maybe it won't, but today, the power of today, is that for this one day, we are with every single Jew in every single moment. Today, we're with those Jews in the cattle cars, being taken to a location of misery and hurt and pain that could, they could not even imagine. Today, we're standing with that mishpacha who was in the besieged Yerushalayim right after the storehouses had been burned down by the Baryonim and Yerushalayim is plunged into famine. Today, we stand right next to that mother shielding her children from the approaching crusaders. 
Today, we stand at the Levayo together with our brothers and sisters in Eretz Yisrael who have to say goodbye to their loved ones after terror attacks. Today, we stand with everyone. The same way this Rav of Piyatrakov was able to get the Negan of the Vashem to response of the Vilna Gaon. He stood with all of them. The power of today is we don't just mourn today one little shul in Pikesville together. But today we have the incredible Zuchus to be able to be part of all of Kalam Yisra.
Zion, just by way of introduction to the Kino, if you look in the source sheet, in source number nine, the overarching theme that we already introduced to last night is the theme of Eicha. And Eicha itself means many different things. Eicha, as far as I understand, means Ayaka. But one of the greatest questions that we face in general when it comes to suffering is that Kaddish Baruch Hu, where are you? Do you do you know what's happening to us? And we know the answer. Kaddish Baruch Hu knows everything. And we also know that Kaddish Baruch Hu is everywhere. But there's still a feeling of Ayaka, where, where are you? But Eicha is also just how. How did it happen? How could this happen? There are events that occurred that seem to defy comprehension, events that occur that seem to go against anything and everything we know about our relation with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Eicha, how, how could this be? How could this be? And there's something interesting about how the Jew asks how. How the Jew asks Eicha or Ayaka, what do we do with these questions and what do we do with these answers? And if you take a look at number nine, there's an incredible piece here by the Shla, called the Shla. The Pasuk says, Remember again, we just read this in last week's parasha. Eva Yardin, Moshe Rabbeinu, remember again, is in his final moments with Klav Yisrael on the other side of the Jordan. And the Torah says, Moshe Rabbeinu, Hoyel. Moshe Rabbeinu began to explain the Torah. And Rashi HaKadosh explains, he explained the Torah in 70 languages. And I actually, I shared this at Hashkab in this past, this past Shabbos. The Shla HaKadosh says something amazing. The Shla HaKadosh says, we know in Gemara, in Gemara, so very often, not very often, sometimes, the Gemara will go through a whole sugya. And how does the sugya end? Teiku. Teiku. And what does Teiku stand for? Tishmi yitareis kushyos ve'ibayos. Eliyahu HaNavi will come and he will answer the questions. Yeah, we have this concept that there are many questions that are left unanswered. For whatever the reason, we can't resolve them. Here in Eliyahu HaNavi comes, he'll resolve them for us. And ask the Shla, what's the source of Teiku? From where do we know this concept that Eliyahu HaNavi will come and he'll answer questions? Where, 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 what's the Makar? And the Shlah says something amazing. The Shlah writes in number 10, well, he writes in number 10, he writes in number 10, but he sees in the Pasuk, he says, the remez to it is in the word Hoel. Hoel is the same letters as Eliyahu. Hoel Moshe Be'eras HaTorah Hazos. Moshe Rabbeinu began to explain the Torah. And whatever we don't understand in the times of Moshe Rabbeinu until Mashiach Hoyo, Ilyo Hanavi will come to explain. Says the Shlach Kaddish, Parashas Devarim, Hoyo Moshe Be'eres HaTorah Azos is the Makar, is the source for the concept of Teiku, for the concept that Ilyo Hanavi will come and he will answer all of our unanswered questions. Rabbi Nachman, says something amazing. I never thought to really tie it together. The Rebbe says, Teku is the same letters as Kinos. It's the same letters. Same letters. An extra known. The same letters. It's a good, it's a Hasidic Shabbat. It's good. It's the same letters. It's the same letters. And it struck me that these two concepts are really tied in with each other which is that at the end of the day, what does the Jew do with Eicha, right? What do I do with Teiku? The strength of our people is the ability to live with unanswered questions, knowing that one day there will be an answer. But just because I can't find it now, doesn't mean that I could resign myself to a life of inaction, you know? I'm just going to show you something amazing. We didn't wear tefillin this morning. 
right? We didn't wear a talus this morning. Why not? Why not? Because remember, again, Tisha B'Av is like Avelos, is like mourning. It, it's a little bit of a reverse mourning. The mourning of Tisha B'Av is like Aninos. When a person is in Oni, when I, Aninos is the period between death and burial. And when a person is in Oni, so what's Talacha? They're potter from mitzvahs. They're exempt from mitzvahs. You can't run around doing Averos, but you're, but you're exempt from positive mitzvahs. What's the Pshat? What's the Pshat? So the Pashat Pshat is, simple idea is, Osik b'mitzvah pata mina mitzvah. The assumption is that the Onain is busy with matters regarded to the burial, to the Shiva. And so because they're engaged in performing one mitzvah, they're exempt from the other mitzvahs. Rabbi Salavechik explains so beautifully. The Rav explains, maybe it's something deeper. Maybe it's that when a person suffers loss, sometimes there's a level of resentment, maybe even a level of anger, disillusionment with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. How did you do this to me? So what did Chazal do? Chazal gave the mourner a little bit of space. You know, to give you a marshal, if a couple gets into a fight, I know no one has a frame of reference for this, but if a couple gets into a fight, so what happens? It could be that one of the spouses is very eager to reconcile. So what does he do? I'll just use he as an example. Right? Right? What does he do? He runs over to his wife and says, okay, let's talk, let's talk. And the wife says, I don't want to talk. And he says, no, 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 but I, but I want to talk. I want to reconcile this. The wife says, I'm not ready to talk. Chavran relationship 101. Sometimes you have to give people the space to re-engage. Just because you're ready to re-engage doesn't mean the other person is. And it's hard because like, I, I want to work through this. I want to deal with this. I, I want to come to resolution. But that only works if the other party is ready for the same thing. Rabbi Soloveitchik explains that that's part of Aninos. Aninos says, something really terrible happened to me. Really terrible. I lost someone. I lost something. And I Kodesh Baruch this all comes from you. So maybe just right now, I'm just not ready to engage. And Rabbi Soloveitchik explains, that halacha gave the mourner the little bit of space. Don't put on your tefillin. Don't put on your talis. You don't even have to make a bracha. Because maybe it's going to feel a little bit disingenuous to say, Baruch ato Hashem Elohim Malach HaOlam. Maybe I'm angry and disillusioned. But something amazing happens. So that's this morning. This morning of Tisha B'av, the pain is so intense that there's a little bit of distance. But what happens? And not even so long. In two hours from now, a little bit more than two hours from now, we're putting on our tillin. We're davening. Putting on talis. Because what does a Jew do with aninos? What does a Jew do with eicha? I ask. I ponder. I allow the pain to course through me. And then I move myself forward. However, the power of our people. No one feels pain like we feel pain. And no one feels collective pain like we feel collective pain. But the power of our people is not in our ability to experience pain. That's part of it. Part of our people, part of our, part of our power is in our empathy. But you know what the greatest power we possess? Is right after we experience Eichon, right after we experience Aninos, and right after we experience pain, we gather ourselves together with all of our answer, unanswered questions, with all of our tekus, and what do we do? We move ourselves forward. I don't allow the unanswered questions to paralyze me. Just like I don't allow the pain to paralyze me. It's there, and the answered questions, unanswered questions sit on my soul but I'm not going to allow the lack of answers to paralyze me from accomplishing the things I know I need to accomplish. So we embrace the Eicha, we embrace the Ayaka, we take the Ho'il, the Eliyahu, 
the teku, and we accept the fact that there are certain questions that are going to remain unanswered. But I will not allow the lack of answers to paralyze me. Instead, I'll take my unanswered questions and forge a path forward. We continue now in Kina 7, Kina Zayin, page 24 in your packet. ایخو <laughs> Kalasabekriya <laughs>
the willingness of the Jew throughout the ages to give on him or herself totally and wholly to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. If you look on the source sheets, we continue in source number 12. These are the Gemars and Masech which talk about the Chorban, which again we did in Dafyomi not so long ago. And their stories... You know, often the challenge with Daf Yomi is the pace in which we have to do everything. So you come across certain things which you know have so much depth and so much profundity, but sometimes the hour doesn't allow it. So I want to look back at a few of these episodes just to plumb the depths, a little bit of what they are and what they represent. So if you take a look at number 12, the Gemara tells a story. There's a story of 400 boys and 400 girls who are taken captive. Now, nishbu l'kalom means they were taken captive. L'kalom means for degradation. So what this means is they were going to be sold into captivity. But captivity wasn't just, you know, forced labor. Captivity also meant ongoing and sustained sexual abuse as well. So this is, this is, what, this is what they were facing. 400, 400 boys and girls. 400 boys and girls, children. They understood already what was going to happen to them. They had, they had an inkling what was going to happen. Amru, they said, And they asked, they're being transported by boat. Transported by boat. And they asked a simple question. If we drown in the sea, if we drown in the sea, do we have olam haba? So, it's an interesting discussion here. So, Tosis, Tosis in number 15 brings down, Tosis says, but one second, isn't there a concept that a person shouldn't take their own life? So, Tosis says, they recognized how much suffering they were going to endure. And they felt that perhaps it should be permitted to end one's life if it's to prevent ongoing suffering. So what was their question? So in the Sefer Yad HaMelech in number 16, Yad HaMelech is a commentary on the Rambam, the son of the Noda Yehuda, he writes over here as follows. He says, Ella, it's the second line after the period, Ella Vadai, Tekhavonas she'ilah samhi ki hoyu yireyim levayi kashlu ba'avon ma'am be'atzma madas, asher ansham chamer kol kach de'ina bo'im v'chaylom abba. What was their question? Question is, we want to take our own lives because we don't want to have to endure the prolonged suffering that awaits us. But if we do that, do we have a portion in the world to come? If we end our own lives, do we have Olam Haba? Dara Shlahan Agadlo Shebahen. Remember, this is a group of children. It's a group of children, 400 children on a boat being led off to captivity. Wondering, could we throw ourselves into the sea, end our short lives, in order not to face the suffering ahead? The oldest one amongst them said, Amar Hashem, Amar Hashem, 
The oldest child amongst them, quoted from the Pasuk from Tilim, which is source number 13 on your sheet, that Hashem said, I shall bring you back from Bashan, I shall restore you, bring you back from the depths of the sea. So he dashed, what does this mean? Mimtsulos yam, elu shetoven bayam. This refers to those who drown at sea. So the oldest child says to the rest of the group, Kaddish Baruch Hu already promised that even those who are lost at sea, Kaddish Baruch Hu will bring them back. So however, just to understand the story, see sometimes we read things in Gemara and we're a little bit emotionally detached from it because it's Gemara. Gemara's intellectual pursuit <laughs> you know, nothing is an intellectual pursuit. Everything in our Ruchnias is a pursuit of the nefesh, a pursuit of the lave that sometimes utilizes the intellect in its journey. The Yid never reads a piece of Gimara just with his eyes and just with his mind. But who could imagine? You wonder, in this moment, one of two things should have happened. Either the world should have ceased to exist because there's this type of pain in the world. Either that should have occurred. How could a world in which this happened exist? How, how could this happen? Either let the world cease to exist, or how could HaKadosh Baruch Hu not send Mashiach just in that very moment? How, 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 does, the, how does the world just go on? 400, 400 children, on a boat, presumably their parents already murdered, being sold off into servitude, wondering, we don't want to face a life of captivity because we know what it means for us. We know what it means for us. Can we throw ourselves into the sea? There's no rav. There's no posek. You know, at least in Eli Wiesel's story, the Jews of Piatrakov, there was a rav. Here, who are the children asking? The God of Shabbat, the oldest child answers, quoting a Pasik from Tehillim. He paskins. The Psak, the Psak, that Akadish Baruch Hu redeem those even who lose themselves, who drown themselves at sea. Kevan Sheshama Yaldaskach, when the girls heard this, Kaftsu Kulam Benaflu Luso Chayam. The young girls. They heard this Jay jumped overboard immediately. Is Olam Haba? We'll have a portion of Olam Haba. <clears throat> These children had no Olam Haza. This world was over for them. Young girls were the first ones to jump off the boat. The boys saw what the girls did and they said, The little boys seeing what the little girls did, if the girls are going to do this, then we should do this as well. Carbon akriv lo es nafshi es nafshi hayechida. Now, what's striking about this story is we're not told who were they, where were they. The biographical details are left out. Do you know why the biographical details are left out? Presumably because a story like this repeated itself multiple times throughout Jewish history. If this was a one-time event in the history of our people, it would have been heartbreaking. But how many beautiful Jewish children and how many beautiful Jewish men and women have given their lives to Dayal Kiddush Hashem throughout our history. Too many to number, too many to name. Ulekarban akriv loes nafshi hayechida. Throughout our history, we've often been called on to give the ultimate sacrifice. 
the sacrifice of our neshama. If we continue on a little bit, we find in source number 17 and 18, the same Gemara Masech as Gittin. Incredible stories, stories that we know. Stories that we know. You know, I've said this in years past. Tishabav, Tishabav is not a day of the intellect, it's a day of the heart, it's a day of the soul. And Tishabav is not a day of Chidushin. It's not a day, oh, I, I learned something new on this. It's not, some, it's not something new. Tishabav, it's the same. It's okay. Are there new stories? Are there no? Uh, sure. There's always new stories of Jewish suffering and difficulties. But it's not about Chiddush. It's about Chazara. If you take a look at number 17, the Gemara goes on the story. This is the story of a woman and her seven sons. So this story actually, I, I put on the sheet appears both in Gemara Masechah's Gittin and in number 18, in Midrash Eicha. And it's virtually the same story. It's a story we know. There was a woman who had seven sons, and the Caesar, the Caesar wanted these children to worship idolatry. And the story is told that the Caesar called each of the boys, starting with the oldest one, and said, bow down. And each child, one by one, refused to bow down. But they didn't just refuse to bow down. They quoted Psukim, they told the Caesar, and child after child refused to bow. Child after child refused to bow. Until the Caesar ultimately comes to the last of the children. And it is here that even the Caesar is moved. Because what the Caesar has just seen is virtually an entire family obliterated. Six children, six children murdered in front of their mother. In front of their mother. And the Caesar himself tries to find a way to spare the life of the youngest child. Remember the Gemara, what does he say? He says to the child, you know what? I'm going to drop my ring. I'm going to drop my ring. Just pick up my ring for me. So that's why you'll give the appearance of bowing down, even though you're not actually bowing down. And the little boy says to the Caesar, Rahmana Allah, Rahmana Allah. Caesar, I feel bad for you. Little Yiddish again, a little Jewish child. Caesar, I feel so bad for you. You're so worried about your own covet that essentially you have to find a way for a little Jewish boy to bow down to you. So now the child is condemned to die. This mother is now about to see the youngest of her children executed. So it is here that I want to draw your attention to something interesting, a distinction between the Gemara and the Medrash. Number 17 is the Gemara. Number 18 is the Medrash. In the Medrash, you'll notice, the Medrash, the underline, Amr Lahon, Imhon, Miriam, Bas, Menachem. Miriam, Bas, Menachem. Right, that's the Gemara says, what's her name? Now what's interesting is, often the woman in this story is identified as Chana. Chana v'sheva Barnao, Chana and her seven sons, in the ancient cemetery in Sfas, right by the steps, not far from the Arizal's mikvah, there's a burial cave. And in that burial cave, they found eight graves. One on one side, seven clustered together. And there's a Masora, there's a tradition that this is the cave of Chana and her seven sons. I remember a number of years ago, when my children were still little, we went to Yisrael. So the joke in my family is that for me, I could spend a day in cemeteries. I probably need some good therapy for this. My family's not as into it. But we're in Sfas, and you can't be in Sfas without going to the ancient cemetery. I remember we walked in, because you could walk, actually. I think you're allowed to walk in. We walked in the whole week, walk all the way into the burial cave there. You could literally see, you could see where there are seven graves and one grave. How overwhelming it was to stand with my children by the kvarm of Chana and her children.
There's so many emotions in that moment. Of course, the tefillah asking HaKadosh Baruch Hu that we should never, ever, chas v'shalom, have to experience the pain of this mother. But also the incredible continuity of Kalal Yisra. Because look how the story ends. So the Medrash identifies her as Miriam Bas Menachem. So actually, let's look at the end of the story in the Medrash. Last couple of lines. So what happens? So now, Miriam Bas, Bas Menachem, and by the way, I think even in the Medrash, I don't know that the name is supposed to be actually biographically accurate or to be descriptive. Because what does Miriam Bas Menachem mean? Miriam is bitter waters, Maryam, the mother who cried such bitter tears. But who is she the daughter of? She's the daughter of the Menachem. She is the daughter of the one who provides consolation. Maybe it is her actual name, maybe it's just a descriptive name. She says to the Caesar, before you execute my child, can I have a few moments with him? Look at it, it says, last, last five lines, last five lines in number 18. I beg of you, give me my son, give me my little boy just for a few moments and let me hug him, and let me, and let me kiss him. So you could imagine this scene. A mother asking just for a few moments in which to embrace her child, to hug her child, to, to kiss her child. So as she's clasping, clutching onto her little boy. She whispered in his ears, in his ear, Bari, my son, Bari Zira, my youngest child. You are going to shortly leave this world. Zil, ve'emalach la'avich Avraham. Go and tell, right, you're going to da'al Kiddush Hashem. And because you're going to da'al Kiddush Hashem, you're going to go to the highest of the high, to the highest levels of Shamayim. And when you get to Shamayim, I want you to seek out Avraham Avinu. Father Avraham, I want you to find him. And I want you to tell him, Ato akaratom izbeach echad. You, Avram, were only called upon to erect one altar. In your entire life, all you had to do was build one Mizbeach. Va'ani akarati shiva Mizbechos. This mother says, I, Miriam Bas Menachem, Chana, whoever she was, I had to erect and use seven altars. What she doesn't say is, Avram, you only built one altar. And Baruch Hashem, you never had to use it. I built seven Mizbechos and had to use each of them. An incredible and overwhelming story. But what I want to highlight for you is in number 19 of Asher Weiss Shlita, in his Sefer Minchas Asher, says, what, what does this mean? What is the mother saying when she says to her son, go and find Avram and tell Avram Avinu, you only built one altar and I built seven and used seven altars. And Minchas Asher writes, he says, look at the third piece, he says, What is she saying? What's the message here? And skip to the third paragraph. He says something amazing. When Avram Avinu was faced with ten, ten tests, and he was successful in all of them. Nasan Bazali Am Yisra Lidoros Olam Kochos Hanefesh Laamod Bechal Hanesionos Sheavu Aleim Mesiras Nefesh. This is absolutely incredible, right? The Minchas Asher. When Avram Avinu passed all of his tests, what did he do? What did he accomplish? Not only did he go ahead and pass the tests for him himself. But what he did is he endowed us, 
his children with a level of spiritual strength to pass our tests as well. When Abraham Avinu summoned up the courage to pass his nisyonos, he put, he embedded in our DNA a sense of spiritual strength to go ahead and pass our tests as well. That, says the Minchas Asher, is what Miriam Bas Menachem, Chana, was telling her son, when you die and you leave this world, you and you go and you find Avram Avinu, and you tell him one simple thing, Avram, thank you. Thank you. Because you, Avram, were strong enough to pass your tests. You have given us your children the strength to pass our tests as well. Chavra, what a profound message. What a profound message for this day of Tisha B'Av. Because what do we do with all of this pain? What do we do with all of this mourning? Every single one of these stories has to give us chizuk, has to give us strength. We are the children of Miriam Bas Menachem. We are the children of Chana. We are the descendants of those 400 children who jumped overboard. Those are our ancestors. You'll say, so what? They don't even know their names. You know who they were. Just like Avram Avinu embedded strength in our spiritual DNA because he passed his tests. We are stronger because of this Mesiras Nefesh. Hevra, when we walk out of Tisha B'Av, one of the most important things that we have to emerge from this day with is a renewed sense and ability to meet our challenges. How often does it happen that there's something in our Yiddishkeit that we feel like is too much for us? Too much for us. It might be hard, it might be difficult. These are our ancestors. Nothing is too much for us. Or maybe we face a life challenge, a circumstance, a situation. We say to ourselves, you know what? I cannot deal with this. Too much for me. Chevra, we can deal with anything and everything. Because look who we come from. Look who we descend from. Just like Avram embedded strength in our spiritual DNA to overcome tests and challenges, every single one of these people, these heroes, every single one of these stories has done the same for our spiritual DNA as well. There is no one stronger than us. There is no one more powerful than us. Each of us is girded and bolstered by the strength of each of these incredible people. And as such, we have the ability to accomplish. We have the ability to meet any challenge. We have the ability to overcome any obstacle. And if you ever try to convince yourself otherwise, or somebody tries to tell you otherwise, just open up Masech Hasgitin, Daphnun Zayin, and just go through the stories. Miriam Bas Menachem, of the 400 children, and we will be reminded how truly powerful we are. We we'll continue now in Kinnah number 8, page 26 on your source sheet. Adad Choga Shamayim, Allah Iti Shamayim, Oyo Mechri Pamayim, Es Onemi Tain Roshi Mayim, Avchin Bifri Ram Midbar, Avchan Alel Milal Midbar Midbar. And Aifcha vashapcha kofen demilai Ege panim bifanim vasos amalai Hau charez vasar milagil mulai 
Zach mi tene fall, mi tavo on mi lai. O rah, mishwate gon ve ali, o diab in si mali, umlulu, mazos pekarim ili. F m mi tene shome ali. As no kofra abiono, abiono skra kisim, mukuna tukutana, as the plug in, mi kreha yona, agar mi tene ve kayona. Es nafshi, es nifsh, es nifshah. Mikayas owns Elsor, Achubli Mayim, Bath Matsor, Achaz Kamos, Liktsor, Vole Los Liftsor, Sicha mi vileni, mi ovileni. I will see his Rasita Tihavos. I must see Behoshana, O Maris Yashanazos. I need to call me Mudazos. Kini, he in no yard, Adinas Asos. Akov the Harosh at the Nahibi, Echra the Hot Mare of the Hatel Machli, Achtir Habishir Mishre Miholi, Achavimi Tenha Kahli, Altishka Sakas Ariel, Elav Lago Yudab Israel, Afish Anasha Masael, Lamor meeting Yeshua Israel, Israel the Ace Pijahilo Halaho, as a Muni Baza team of Pan Ewe Pahu, Aganti Vela team, I believe in Shpahu. Echad tifarti mirasha sai yishlichu.
but it's amazing how never enough time for everything, even, even to mourn. I'm going to draw your attention now to page 7. This is, we'll come back to some of the other sources, page 7. Spend a few moments remembering Yaakov Yisrael Pale and Asha Menachem Pale. Zechronim Levracha Hashem Yikom Damam, who were murdered by a terrorist in Ramot just in February this year. is the overwhelming part of the day. Go from a Gemar Masech to February 2023. Tchema, tell me, you look at these pictures. Have you ever seen two sweeter children? Asher Menachem, the older of the two boys, was born on Tisha B'av. That's why his parents gave him the name Menachem. Based on the Yerushalmi that says that Mashiach is born on Tisha B'av. And the Yerushalmi says that his name is Menachem. A little boy born on Tisha B'av. And not being remembered on Tisha B'av. Gitten on Zayin to February 2023. Chavra, let me ask you. Do you think the children on the boat weren't just as sweet and just as angelic? And probably had the same exact beautiful smiles as these two precious little boys. Remember again, this attack occurred on Friday night of Shabbos. Little Yis- Yaakov Yisrael, he was pronounced dead at the scene. His levaya took place before Shabbos. And his older brother, Asha Menachem, died on Shabbos. I know what it means to come into the world on Tisha B'Av and to die on Shabbos. What beautiful on the Shabbos these boys were. How special they must have been to have somehow fulfilled their tachlis in just a short amount of time. And Asher Menachem's Levaya was on Matzah Shabbos. And if you remember in the story, the two boys were by the bus stop with their father, Avram, who was critically injured as well. He was actually in a coma for, I think, close to a month. He wasn't at Levaya for his sons. He wasn't at the Shiva for his sons. And I want to show you something amazing. If you turn the page to page 8, this is a picture after Avram Pillay was released from the hospital, still in a wheelchair, still unable to walk. 
And for the first time, he's brought to the graves of his two sons. I just wanted to share with you just some pieces from the articles because they give you a window just into the suffering, into the pain of a father, of a mother. Number 26, The first time the father, Afram Palei, who was injured, comes to the kever, to the, to the graves of his sons who were murdered. Bati lihi parade. I came to say goodbye. Batili Barit. In fact, if you look, I apologize for making you turn the pages, but if you just look for a moment on page nine, we'll go back and forth a little bit. There was a very moving video of Avram Pale at the at the at the farm of his children. And here on the top of the just screenshot of the, the Twitter feed, you could see the right over here, the Rishana Me'az Hapigua Bramot Avram Pale Alalik Varam Shal Shnei Ladav Shinir Tzuchu. For the first time, Avram Pale goes to the cover of his two sons who were murdered, Asher Menachem Yaakov Yisrael Uparaz Bebechi. He began to cry. Mitukim, my sweet ones. Though he spakti li pared mika. I never got to say goodbye to you. I thank Hashem that He gave you to us. The pain of losing someone and the pain of not being able to say goodbye. Bati li parade. I came to say goodbye. Lo hispakti lihi pareit mekem. Chazal tell us that Yaakov Avinu davens for illness. He davens that a person should get ill before they die. Why? Medrash says that a person should realize that the end is near, they should get their affairs in order. But I think it's also that people should get to say goodbye. I never got, who can imagine, a father says, my two little boys, I never got to say goodbye. And the articles detail, they're much longer articles. I put the web addresses here so you can look at it on your own as well. And it's very moving the way it describes his visit to the cavern. I'm going back to 26 for just a moment. Father continues, In Adam Shalom, Nagatem Balev Shalom. This is Avram Pale saying about his sons. There's no person whose heart you didn't touch. Big Shukah. Avora Mishpacha, Davin, that our family should have strength. You realize, like, the lopsided nature of that tefillah. It's children who look to parents for strength. And now it's a father davening to the neshamas of his children. My children, you who are on high, find strength for us. It's the first time the father had the opportunity to eulogize his sons as he was not at the cavern because of his injuries. If you skip a little bit to 27, another article here. It has such sweetness, a joy of life, and a pure heart. 
Avram Palei Nifza Kasha Be Pugua Hadrisa Bishkunas Ramab Yushalayim Be Meshach Karov Le Shalosh Shavuasu Haya Ben Chaim Lamabas Murdam Umunsham Be Sacholim For three weeks he was sedated. Murdam means he was, he was sedated. Munsham, he was on breathing apparatus in the hospital. Mibli Shuhu Yodea Ma'ala Begora Banav Shai Ito Biome Pikua. So ultimately, again, during those three weeks, he had no idea what had happened to his children. Ben He heard, he woke up recently, and he said, heard that his two sons had been killed and a third son had been lightly injured. Avram Pana Lekever Shel Adava Amar. Avram Pala went to the graves of his sons and he said, and he wrote it, Lahagid Lachem Toda. He said to his two little boys, I want to tell you thank you. Al Kopam Shayiti Lome Ditchem, whenever I had the opportunity to learn with you, Hayiti Yotse Mechuzak, I went out strengthened. How much the two of you loved to learn. If you turn to page 9. Od Amad al Kivrei Banav Bebechi, Ani Modula Kaddish Baruchu, Shenatan Alano Etchem, Hayita Bachem Mitikut Simchat Chaim, Balev Tahar Vekadosh. That's so much sweetness, so much goodness. Pure heart. So is Damnus Lahodos the Kol Am Yisrael ala Tfilos Agdolos. And he goes ahead and he tells thank you to Kol Yisrael for all of your Tfilos. The article ends in an incredible way. The mother Devora is pictured on the bottom. She actually recently gave birth to a, to a baby boy. So Devora Pale Imam Shalom Etzachim Sipra ala Raga Shabo Avram Hitorer. My friends, you, have, you just have to understand something, that with this tragedy, not only were these two precious boys killed, but the father, the head of the household, wasn't there. So someone who presumably the family would look to for strength, someone who the family would look to for stability, someone who the family would look to for nechama, he wasn't there. He was, he was in the hospital, sedated, intubated. No, no one knew what was going to happen to him. So now this mother, this mother who clearly is an exceptional woman, an Aim Bisrael, an Eishes Chayil, without measure, she has to tell her husband about what happened. He didn't know what occurred. She has to tell him what happened. And so she writes, she, they interviewed her. She said, Pachadnu meharega hazema od. We were very scary, scared about what was going to happen when we told my husband. She said, essentially, it went as well as it could. I told, her, I told my husband what happened. He woke up. He made brachas. He wanted to make the brach of Dayana Anas. Bikesh Chutzal the Kriya. He asked for a shirt. So he gets to Kriya. The Amar Shut Sarech La Shavas Shiva. And he was ready. He said he had to sit Shiva. Hu Hayama Od Mifukas. Aval Kimuvan. Shu Hischil Livkos. Ula At La At La Achilas Hamatsios. He began to cry. And slowly but surely began to absorb the enormity of what had occurred. And I will tell you that if all a person does on Tisha B'av, if the only thing you do is sit and look at this picture, that's a Tisha B'av. What more does a person have to do than look at the picture of two beautiful little boys waiting at a bus stop with their father on Erev Shabbos, killed by a terrorist, 
for what crime? What crime can you commit at the ages of five and seven? What crime? That they're Jewish? That they're living in Eretz Yisrael? This is the totality of Tisha B'Av. Literally, even if a person doesn't say one kina, doesn't, a person looks at the pictures of these two beautiful little boys. That is Tisha B'Av. But there's another set of brothers. That's on page 10. Another beautiful set of brothers. These brothers, Hillel and Yagel Yaniv. From the community of Harbracha, two brothers in a car together returning home. This occurred only a few days later. This happened on February 26th. You remember the story in Khuara? Terrorists stopped, right? The car was stopped, killed them at point blank range by firing through the windshield. Two brothers. Two brothers. And if you look in 28, Hillel, the Agel Yaniv, They were both buried in Har Herzl military cemetery. Hillel, had already finished the Hesder program, having served in the Navy. And Yagel was still enrolled in the Hesder program, was getting ready to begin his military service in Kravi in a, in a combat unit. And they were both murdered, buried in Har Herzl. He goes around, he says, Horeim Shal Shnei Achim, the parents of the two brothers, Haraf Shalom the SD Yaniv, they told about the hours leading up to when they received this information. So the mother Esti said, there are no words to describe this type of tragedy. What could one say? So the mother is supposed to bring her sons to the chuppah. But instead of bringing my sons to the chuppah, instead of, we will bury them. I'm sorry, it's repetitive. Skip down a little bit. Esti, Esti Yaniv, the mother, said that this is a time, this tragedy should be a call for Achdus and Kalad Yisrael. Anachnu o'avim es hamedino, o'avim es atzaba barot sebitachon. We love the country, we love the army, we want security. Anachnu rotsim achdus. She goes on. Anachnu mishtadlin mekabel ba'avo. Es habesura ha'kosha she'akodesh baruch hu nasan lanu esmo. Sipra b'demos rachal Yaniv. They interviewed the sister, Rachel, the sister of, of Hillel and Yagel, and she says, we are trying to accept with love the difficult news that HaKadosh Baruch Hu visited upon us. The Yamuna of a young girl. The young girl, we're trying to accept it. It's difficult and it hurts. Of, look at her words. We are experiencing days that are simply not pashat, not simple. We are strong. Isn't this not the most incredible words? Kalal Yisrael has gone through so much. We've been through so much. We will be able to withstand this challenge as well. Ha'achot Rachel Ekira. The sister Rachel went on. Ki ani amshich lagor kan. Oli yashev esaret Yisrael. I will continue to live here to settle the land. Hillel v'yagel. Ha'yirotzim shenitabel. 
אבל נמשיך גם ונשמח ונחגוג. הלל יגאל would want us to mourn for them, but then would want us to go on and to be happy and to celebrate. היא הוסיפה, כי לא חשבתי שאגיע לסיטואציה כזו. פתח שלא בגיל הזה. She thought I would never, this little girl is saying, I never thought that this would be my situation, not at this age. אבל מה שהשם נותן, אנחנו מודים. Whatever Hashem gives us, we say thank you. אנחנו לא, לא מבינים את זה, we don't understand it, אבל כנראה שזה מה שהמשפחה הזאת צריכה. חבר'ה, אמונה, unparalleled אמונה. And this, this is not someone who art school is writing a biography about. This is not a woman of 60, 70 years old. This is not a rabbit in somewhere. This is a little girl, a young girl in Har Bracha. Who understands? Hashem Nasan, Hashem Lakach, Yehi Shem Hashem Evorach. Hashem gives, Hashem takes. Hashem does everything that needs to be done. And our job, our job, is to try to figure out a way to forge forward. We don't understand it. This is what we have. And the life of a Jew is about taking what I have and somehow figuring out how to navigate forward. She said, we have received a slap in the face from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Anachnu menasim limsoas hadvarim hatovim, page 11. Shahayu donem ayeladim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, sholeach kasodim, kamim hamaka hako eves. The reason I wanted you to, I, I put this article on the sheet, is this is not an article, this is a Musr Sefer. This is a Musr Sefer. These people are tzaddikim gimurim who show us what it means to accept adversity with emuna. It is easy to be a Baal emuna when everything goes your way, when life goes according to your way. And so often, friends, I will tell you this, I've come to find, maybe it's the wrong thing to say, but I've come to find that herein lies one of the most fundamental distinctions between the Jews of Galus and the Jews of Eretz Yisrael. Jews, Jews of Eretz Yisrael are made of tougher material. Sometimes we're just a bit too fragile. Things don't go away and suddenly we're suffering from all types of theological crises. Sometimes there's a patch from HaKadosh Baruch and sometimes the patch is hard and difficult. But look, these are regular people. These are regular people that you would have never heard of before in your entire life. These are people who would have never gotten headlines for anything they did or didn't do. The only reason we know about them is because their two sons were murdered. And because we know about them, now we have the opportunity to see their unshakable and unbreakable emunah. This is what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants. Kacha HaKadosh Baruch Hu rotzeh. As Rabbi Nachman writes, Kacha HaKadosh Baruch Hu rotzeh. And our job is to figure out a way to accept it, and then to figure out a way to move ourselves forward with productive, meaningful living. It's a patch, writes Esti Yaniv. He says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Sholoyach Chasadim, Gamim Amaka Ko'ebes. HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends us incredible chasadim, incredible kindnesses, even with the difficult, even with the difficult, makim, difficult patch. Yesh lanu chur anak belev, v'shum davar lo yiskar asachar hazeh. There is a huge, gaping hole in our hearts, and nothing will ever fill the hole. Lo biniya, lo hafkana, lo shum davar. And this is an incredible statement as well. There's always a response to tragedy. Always is a response. You know, the, by the mit nachalim, the phrase that's often used is, bevinyana tenachamena. Through building, we'll be consoled. Someone is taken from us, Someone is murdered. With every loss of Jewish life, we will just build more and more and more. And I think in Esti Anif's statement, there's something very profound. Is that beautiful? It's beautiful. And it speaks to the resilience of Klal Yisrael. What doesn't it speak to? To the gaping hole that is never filled. 
She says, there will always be this gaping hole in my heart. No hafkana, no rally, no community, nothing will ever fill this hole. However, this is the other part of Tisha B'Av that's difficult for us. I think one of the reasons sometimes that we have such difficulty with Tisha B'Av is because we like to be solution-oriented. There's a problem. Let me figure out how to fix it. That's my goal. I want to fix the problem. But the reality is there are certain problems that you cannot fix. Sometimes there's a loss, and a loss means that there is forever a gaping heart in a person's soul. Speak to someone who has lost a child. Rahmara letzlan lo aleinu. Speak to someone who lost a child. Does that person have additional simchas? Of course. Are there beautiful milestones? A hundred percent. Is there light in life again? Yes, absolutely, unequivocally. Is the loss ever go away? Is the hole ever filled? Never. That loss, that hole, is a part of their life for the rest of their lives. It never goes away. Part of the challenge of Tisha B'av, part of the challenge of Tisha B'av, is that the avoda is allowing the hole to exist. It's not a resolution. It's not, okay, let's do this and by the end we'll feel better. The challenge of Tisha B'av is do it, and by the end you'll feel worse. It's not a very tantalizing right, tagline. Right? Come do kinnis, and you'll feel worse at the end than when you started. But that's the avoda, not to feel worse, but to feel. But to feel. So often we wall off emotions, so often we wall off feelings, and especially when it comes to pain. We're often reticent and unwilling to allow ourselves to feel pain. I don't want to feel uncomfortable. I don't want to feel sad. I don't want to feel displaced. But what it means to be part of Am Yisrael is to allow yourself to feel these feelings. But I want to show you how this story ends. Take a look at number 29. Because I just told you the story of two brothers, two sets of brothers. The Palay brothers, the Palay brothers, Yaakov, Yisrael, and Asher, Menachem and the Yaniv brothers, Hillel and Yagel. In 29, look what happens. And once again, we've seen the most painful picture. What is the most painful picture that a person could ever see? Shnei Achim. Two times in just a matter of weeks, we see the same heartbreaking pictures. Two brothers murdered alongside one another, being laid to rest alongside Vima, Shemekabelas Bisora Kefula Vinora. And we hear about a mother who hears the news of a double tragedy. I quoted this before. She said, I never imagined such a thing like this. I always thought that I would take my sons down to the chuppah. Now I must take them to be buried. There are no words to describe a tragedy like this. Look, look at the last paragraph over here. Devora mevakeshes limsorla tanhumin. However, the heart cannot absorb w- w- these words. Devora Pele, Devora Pele, who had lost her sons just a few weeks earlier, wanted to reach out with words of consolation to Esti Yaniv. However, the, the story. The, Story doesn't make sense. Story, it, the story does, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't. It, it doesn't. It doesn't compute. Devora Pele, who buried by herself without her husband, her two precious boys, Yaakov Israel, 
age 5 and Usher Menachem age 7. The Vora Pelé wants to reach out to Esti Yaniv to give her words of consolation. And he wrote to Hagidla, Va'ani Minasa Litsuri Takesha. So the Vora Pelé said in this interview, I want to tell her and I want to try to create the connection with her. Masha Amruli. This is Devora Pelé saying, I want to tell Esti Yaniv what people said to me. Shehem Hayu Karbanot Shal Am Yisra. Devora Pelé said that when I was sitting Shiva for my sons, people told me that little Yaakov Yisrael and little Asher Menachem were the Karbanos of Kalal Yisrael. They were the offerings of our nation. Ratzinu Sha Karbanot Shalanu Yuach Ronim. Aval Hine, Od Yaakov, Vaod Menachem, Shem Baofen Kolkach Simbuli, Gam Kishne Achim. So the Vorapale says, I thought that these my Karbanos were going to be the last Karbanos. But apparently there are two more. Two more brothers to be the Karbanos of Am Yisra. And look what she writes. The fact that brothers are taken. Esti Pelé says, maybe, maybe the message that my two little boys, brothers, maybe the message that as the Yaniv's two boys, brothers, are taking us to remind us that we are brothers. We are one nation. Maybe we have to do whatever we can to guard our unity. To not be separated and to not allow ourselves to be in a state of battle of war with one another. Stories of two brothers, Pelé brothers, the Yaniv brothers, Yaakov Yisrael, Asher Menachem, Hillel and Yagel, one bereaved mother trying to console another bereaved mother, our children. Our children are the Karbanos of Kalal Yisrael. However, we don't know what the message is in these types of tragedies. We don't know what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is trying to convey to us, but one thing is clear. There has to be something. There has to be something. Maybe now we'll take a moment in the schos of these two beautiful sets of brothers, these Kiddoshim. There is a beautiful tefillah that was written by Rav Tzvi Rimon. Rav Rimon is a well-known Rav in the Gush. It's on page 17 in your packet. And Rav Rimon asked that Kihilos recite this particular tefillah as a schos for the Achtos of Klav Yisrael. Specifically with everything that's going on in Eretz Yisrael now, all of the machlokes and all of the difficulties. Maybe in the source of these brothers, these karbanos. Again, it's true. The first thing you see when you look at their beautiful pictures is brotherhood, is connection. Page 17 together will say in the orange box, Mishabera Chavoseinu, Avraham, Yitzchak, Viyakov, Hu Yivarech V'yishmar, Kal echad li achos mi am Yisrael. Yitain bli benu lahabit ba'ayin tova al hakol. Yitain banu ava gidola al kol echad ba achos mi Yisrael. Veniska la achdus isana ulegula shalema bikarov bi ameno menomar amen. I'll say the tefillah also of the Rebbe. Berar Melech, Rameli Melech of Lezhansk, the Nomeli Melech writes in the blue box below, is the tefillah called Adarabah. The Rebbe writes Adarabah. 
Tain Blibenu, Shinira Kol Echad Malos Haverinu, Belo Chesronum. Shenedaber Kol Echad Es Havero, Bedera Hayashar, Baharatsui, Lefanaho. The Al Yal Abibenu Shum Sino, Me Echad Al Havero Halilo. Usehazek Osano be Avo Eleha Kasher Galui via Dual Lefanaho. She Hakol Nahas Ruach Eleha. Oh, he
you just bear in mind. Just to always remember that one day Mashiach is going to come. And there'll be Tchias Amesim. And just know that we're going to see the day where Avram and Devorah Pelei are to see their two little boys running back to them. I'll be zochet to see the day of Hashem when the Yanni family will see their two young men. Hello, and Yagal running back to them as well. We have to believe. Be'amun shalema. And that day will come. And hopefully, hopefully, Merz Hashem, if we just keep doing what we're supposed to be doing, then Halavai will be Zoha, Merz Hashem, that day will come. The Karav Biyamenu. We're going to continue on a little bit. We're going to recite now the Kinnis for the Holocaust. We're going to spend our remaining time on those kinnas. Which can be found in the back on page 39. 39. We have two kinnas. One written by the Baba Rebbe, Zechitzad of the Kaddish Levracha. The Rebbe, we've spoken about the Rebbe many times in the past, that the Rebbe is really one of those who was responsible for rebuilding Yiddishkeit in America after the war. The Rebbe lost everything, came to America with one surviving child, didn't intend to be a Rebbe, but became a beacon of hope and a beacon of Kiddusha to so many whose lives were shattered. People said if the Rebbe could rebuild, we could rebuild as well. Let's begin now on page 39 in the packet. The kina le zichron kidoshim shal chorban Europa, the kina for the six million. Zichrona the konino Yisrael kol chami sham brama kish mida germanya sameinu meizama milchama amisos mashunos achzarios peravu b'sama atish kechu bechaladolos adaitis kolir osmanechama. Sakasamkiosa <laughs> Yom Galino, Miarsino, Lahaya Kaza, Kilana Kilayon, Nora, Rahima Sherry, Sino, Habet Nami Shamayim, Mahano Sandoshin, Bias Yose, Misraim, Komeim, Base Kachino, Manahamino, Yuflaim, Omen of Abin Lison, Sion Mirshalayim. So we continue on page forty which is the Kinnah for the Holocaust, composed by Rav Schwab, Zecher Tzadik Levracha, page 40. Hazocher manzkirov, dar dar kdoshav, meis hashar bazchar tonu, iskar dira'on shodar acharon, oya mehayalano, shetufei mabodam, shamasru nafsham, kol shrekuei, imke abacha, yifkidei melohim ba'arzo sachayim ba'day ad zikram levracha, so I love Kapai Maha Ishama Yim Ho Ametav Shifte Yisrael Eidos Hilos Arim Glilos Chavaros Mosados Komande El Mite Pagimaim Tiradna Inaim Alashdos Nahayat Maos Ale Alfe Alafim Gufim Nisrafos Kimo Eshachor Banus Vaos 
חוסר התורה מחזיקי המסורה ברכי הכהונה הצעירים החוש להם ג'שוס מורים מורוס תנקוס ביס רבון יקירים אבונוס פותחוס ושמים סבוס עזרם וטפם שילדו וגם רבוס רבוס נאהבים וחיים ועושים לא נפרדו יש לנו עוד ראש כיסי סס ראש של כל נידף עלים תרופוס כל נפשוס מייס ומשבר לסייס שישה אלפי פעמים יפים שלישי על לבער ברירה זעק זעם סוער מכאן מייחמד אהבת כל אדם נא וזכר את סעדם על צמחה מספר כספתא זכור נא כוס ורש צעקוס אז יבלו לרצח יורי דמיהם ודמעוז פניהם לא תשאל לנצח כל חיל ובניחה וזכר משדני להקס ומכס כלבים זכור צפור בנדוס צרה עד עץ נקום עלבון עלבונים המחנוס הפרעים כאילו נגיעים פחי נפש נס עגומוס חרפוס חרפוס וצטחוס לימה ורוק פצחי הקרוס חיומה איומוס ורעבון צמאון שאי עוני צבון כישלו נשלם מכוח חול נעקוס חלה מכל יחיד אומלם חלילה לחם מלשכוח בשים נוס עשן וכיתו מכבשן תילי תילים עצמוס וגידים וחדרי הרעל שאונגול שאנגוס מכאן נחנכים תוך תאי העדים סיר חום גופוס וגביוס וגופוס כלל דומן עד מס נועצים איך הפכו טרפיהם לבורים מחלביהם ועוד איש לתקושים נשים קפיצס אצבעו של ראשי הפרעוס ממין שיבוט פרח צמאוס לשמאל ואיך ירו ירידוס על חופי הבורוס אשרי חיבוט קבר הורידם שאול איך עינו אך יוסינו וסרסו בנוסינו כל סוס תראי למידי רוטים אכזרים פליטי הסבידים ממחילוס וסתרים זין ילדים בבתי שמד וגמרים סתמים לעולם דם בלי הגולל הוי אריאל מניבלס חזינך הצום כל השם יהיה מנה אשר ישון לא סבקה נכון היו מקדשי שמך וכל שמי ישראל מסרו נפש לאו שיוצאים עד יום האחרון הצדיקו דין אף אני מאמין אנו ושלום שנס ביטחון ובכי נשאר עם כי עושים ניתן בלי קברים לשטח ומצאו איפה לבכוס יבבוס לבב רוסח רק נזקי אדם אז קרוסם נשוכי עכברי עפרי אי כאן עשם תרומות לשני מזבח מי ימלא צער ישראל שנדעת מחיפ נטרפס ושרי ספר כים עיר זי עיר וחמסה יום נחפפס אל חיים מרחים עד אסך הנחים עד אשר מוס נחשפס אור חדוש תזויח קרנת תשמיח רוח אלוהים מרחפס draw your attention now to page 12. Page 12 is uh, an incredible story. An incredible story. Again, this is, I mentioned before, from the, from the Kalev Rebbe's book, Shema Yisrael. And he has in here, it's just incredible. He writes over here, this is Auschwitz at Liberation. When the liberation came, most of the surviving prisoners headed for the warehouses of Auschwitz, which were bulging with loot the former possessions of murdered victims. The survivors stormed these warehouses, grabbing whatever they could. Only one group took no part in the raid. These were the former Beis Yaakov students. Even in the giddy moments of liberation, when everyone was drunk with relief, and the thought first of regaining whatever material objects they could grab, these young women just went on caring for others and saving lives, as they had all along. Then they discovered on the campgrounds a block full of children. The murderers hadn't had time to kill them. There were even infants in this block brought to Auschwitz from all over Europe. The mothers had been murdered and their babies were now left with no one to nurture them. The girls who discovered these children immediately set about caring for their needs and kept doing so until the camp was closed down for good and the children were on their way to foster families. Who is like Chalad Yisrael? One of the hallmarks of our people is a sense of achrayis, a sense of responsibility for the other. 
even if I'm okay, even if I'm beseder, at the end of the day, my achray is my responsibility for the other. It never goes away. It's always there and always something I must nurture. And another incredible story. Take a look at page 31. This is also, this is actually a story about the Kalev Rebetzin. The Rebbe's wife, listen to this. Bergen Belson. I was one of a group of 2,000 women on the death march from Auschwitz. The cruelty of the guards was unspeakable. Many women were wounded and beaten each night when they stuffed us into stables. One night I was too frightened to be inside and I managed to stay outside under the open sky in the middle of a snowstorm in the freezing cold. In the morning when the order was, when the march was given, my skin peeled right off the soles of my feet. They had frozen onto the crust of snow. The Red Army was catching up with us. The defeated Germans had no time left to march us around on foot. So they loaded us onto a cargo train, into cattle cars. The crowding was unbearable. One girl went insane because of it. She was searching everywhere for a place to sit down. And when she couldn't find it, she flew into a fit of madness and bit my hand and another woman's. She bit deep and the hand swelled up until it looked like a ball. The situation was grim and there was no way of getting treatment for the wound. At the journey's end, I arrived at Bergen-Belsen where we were given some imitation coffee to drink. It was weeks since we had anything proper to drink. We had survived by eating snow. But I thought a bit and said, Master of the Universe, it's been weeks since I was able to wash my hands in the morning. Weeks since you were able to do Nagelwasser. Instead of drinking the coffee which might have put a bit of strength back into my wasted body, I poured it over my hands in honor of my Creator. Then a wonder occurred. A moment later, the wound on my hand began to, sca began to scab over right then and there. In a few days, my hand was healed. This hand that had obeyed the Creator's command was in turn healed by the healer of all flesh, Calvert Abbotson. The miracle is incredible, but the truth is the miracle is not the essence of the story. It's the Nesiras Nefesh. It's the willingness to sacrifice for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The Rebetzin would have asked the Shaila, what should she do with the coffee, drink it or, or wash Nagel Vasser? The Psaq is clear. You drink it. It's Pikuach Nefesh. But sometimes the Yid just has to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And however, the reason I share these stories with you, I don't know that we're on this level, but this is who we come from. This is the people we belong to. The Mesir HaSnefesh of the Kalav Rebetzin is embedded within each of us. And in those moments when we think that we can't do anymore, in those moments when we think we can't push ourselves a little bit harder, in those moments when we think we simply have no strength to continue on, just remember that we are the spiritual descendants of the Kalav Rebetzin. And if the Rebbe, the Rebetzin could decide to use that last bit of coffee for Nagel Vassar, we're not called upon to do such things. But if she could exhibit that little, that incredible level of strength, then we certainly have the ability to go ahead and exhibit dynamic and incredible strength in our Yiddishkeit as well. One last story, and then we'll conclude with Elit Sion. If you skip to page 34, this to me is such an incredible and overwhelming story. It's a story about the Satmar Rav. The Satmar Rav, Rav Yol Teitelbaum, the old title bomb, you know, everyone always knows the Rav, Satmar Rav, you know, for, for his, you know, stances on Zionism and on the Medina. Okay, the, the, Rav, the Satmar Rav, the Rabbi had his shitas. But bigger than anything that the Rav felt about the state of Israel, the Satmar Rav was a tzaddik, was a gaon who possessed immeasurable avas Yisrael, who was an unmatched and unparalleled Baal Chesed, and who was someone who was willing to give everything and anything for the ability to keep HaKadosh Baruch Hu's Torah Mitzvah. So listen to this story. This is in Bergen-Belsen. So in Bergen-Belsen, 1944. Even in Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, the Sat Rebbe absolutely insisted on washing himself every Erev Shabbos in honor of the approaching day. Now understand there were no facilities 
There are no facilities. And washing himself often meant immersing himself in a large puddle. But the Sat Rebbe was not going to go into Shabbos without somehow washing himself in the Shabbos. He also insisted on pouring a jug of water over his body in place of immersion in a mikvah, which is impossible under the circumstances. Then he would put on a complete set of clean clothes. How the Rebbe was able to get clean clothes, who knows? Right down to freshly washed white socks, which glittered with cleanliness in honor of the Shabbos queen. Have a listen to this story. All this was in spite of the fact that just by leaving his block to go to the bathhouse, he was putting himself in great danger lest the Germans spot his bearded countenance. If they discovered that he had not obeyed the rule that all beards must be shaved, the consequences would be terrible. Nor could the Rebbe escape the deep mud that was everywhere in the camp practically every day of the year. He did not worry about it. He washed, put on clean clothes for Shabbos, and never minded if everything was covered with mud as soon as he emerged from the bathhouse. He did what he needed to do. It was as if no power on the earth could touch him. I would say this is the story I want to end off with today. Because this is the Nitzchias of Klal Yisrael. Just so if you could imagine, right, the Messiah Snefesh to get clean clothing. The Messiah Snefesh, they had to clean white socks. The Rebbe would bathe, whatever bathing meant in Bergen Belsen. The Rebbe put on his clean clothing. But again, remember to get out of the bathhouse. It was mud, which meant that as soon as you walked out, you were going to be covered in mud. So a person would say, a person would say, what's the point? You're putting on this cleaning covered Shabbos, Sasa covered Shabbos, and, and five minutes later, two minutes later, one minute later, you'll be covered in mud. And what the Rebbe was teaching us, not with words, but in deed, was that sometimes in life you just have to do what you're able to do in the circumstances visited upon you. Life is often less than ideal. And life often confers upon us less than optimal circumstances. So you could go ahead and you could say, if it can't be great and if it can't be perfect, what's the point of trying? Or you could say, if this is the hand that I have been dealt, if this is the situation that I have been given, then I have to do my best to maximize it. However, at the end of the day, that's the Sat Marav was doing. Okay, I'm going to wash the covered Shabbos. I'll be covered with mud in five minutes from now. I just have to do what's upon me. And what's upon me is to do something the covered Shabbos. Chevra, whether you're a Satmar Chassid or not, all of us are spiritual descendants of the Satmar Rebbe. That Koach is in us. That Koach is in us. That koach, to be able to take all of the pain, all the disappointment, all the disillusionment, all the difficulties, say, okay, this is what I got. Now, how do I make something of it? That was the koach of the Satmarov, the koach of the Kalav Rebetzin, the koach of the Yaniv family, the koach of the Pale family, the koach of pretty much anyone and everyone who we have focused on this morning together. Before we get up and we sing Kilitzion, we'll sing Animam and when we finish. However, I just want to say it's been an incredible schos to be able to spend the morning and now the early afternoon of Tisha B'Av together. And hopefully again, we know what our avoda is. Bless you. Our avoda is to gain strength from all of the loss, to gain strength from all the difficulties to use that strength to cry bitter tears, to mourn all that has been lost, but then to use it to be mechazek ourselves. This is our people. This is Klal Yisrael. And I would say, there is no time of year when I feel more proud to be a member of this magnificent people than on Tisha B'Av. Because on Tisha B'Av, throughout all of the tears, we recognize, we recognize that we have a koach that the world can't understand that we have a koach that humanity cannot understand, that we have a koach to persevere, we have a koach to move forward, and hopefully with all the stories and all of the accounts and all of the tragedy, you walk away 
with a heightened sense of chizik about what you can accomplish as an individual. Because if this is who our people are as a nation, it is true that this is who we are as individuals as, are, as, as well. There is no challenge we cannot meet. There is no hurdle we can't overcome. There is no obstacle that can stand in our way as individuals and as a people. This is the power of this day of heartbreak. This is the power of Tisha B'Av. And so we end the same way we began. We began with Shira Malas B'Shuvah Hashem HaShiva Siyon Yinu Kecholmim. And we began today, we began today disoriented. Because that's what grief does to you, it disorients. But we end in a very different way. We end. I'm not disoriented anymore. I'm sad. And I'm heartbroken. And I feel like I've been broken into a million pieces. But I feel so strong. I feel so confident. And I feel that at the end of the day, whatever challenges HaKadosh Baruch Hu has in store for me, and I hope and I dive in that they aren't great challenges, but whatever they are, because of my Tisha B'Av, I feel equipped and I feel ready to meet them head on. That this will be the last Tisha B'Av that we will spend in Galos. We're going to take all of our kinnis and put it in Shemus, bury it and be done with it because we're not planning for this for next year. That we should see the Geula. That we should see the return to Yerushalayim. The return to Eretz That we should see peace within our ranks. That we should see Shalom and Am Yisrael. That we should be Zochem Yerat Hashem to see Tchiyas HaMesim. And every single broken family made whole again. We should be Zochem Yerat Hashem. To see our people gather together as one, and all of the people and all of the stories that we've learned. However, imagine what's going to happen. Mashiach comes. Imagine what's going to happen when those 400 children from the Sechaz Gitin, who died al Kiddush Hashem, imagine when we see them. Playing in the parks of Yerushalayim. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And you're going to say, I learned your story. I learned your story. But Mesechah's getting Daphne and Zion only contains the beginning of the story. The end of the story has not yet been written. But it will be written soon. It will be written by Mashiach. It will be written by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It will be a most... It will be a most beautiful end to a heartbreaking story. A story of so much pain, a story of so much difficulty, a story of so much sadness and tragedy. I tell you, we know what the end is. The end of this terrible tale of sadness is Gula, is Tchiyas Amesim, is Mashiach, is Achdos, is all of Klal Yisrael together. May be Zochem Yerat Hashem to witness 
HaKadosh Baruch Hu write the concluding chapter of this story. And may we be Zohar Hashem to see it together. Mihir Rabbi Amenu. Amen. Continue now on page 42 with Elit Sion.
So he says, so he says, so sure enough, he's, he's on he's on the front line and uh, he wants to eat something, so he wants to eat some bread. So he has to go somewhere else to get the water because there's no water right there on the front line. He has to go somewhere else to get water. And when he kills the dog, a bomb comes in to kill us, the people where he was standing. All because he wants to eat us at the time. Oh, yeah. Our story that you're talking about, like, you know, the power of missiles, the yeah. power of missiles, that's something you don't even realize, like, yeah. how powerful things are that we have. You know, mm-hmm. Well, yeah. it's incredible. Yeah. It's just it's incredible. incredible. And said so that's a story that all the Chabad people know because, right. you know, what it means. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. you were you were better than you were. You are always the best. But they plus plus the by the last year. Last year. Last year. Last year. Last year. Last year. Next year we do a new Rishon. We don't we just celebrate. Celebrate the ninth. Uh, uh, you know, it's Yerushalayim. 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 
People don't know it. I mean, people, I don't say it helps with instruments. I'm not going to do it. We have. We have later. We still have time later. That's true. Oh, sure. Time later. So. Yeah, we have time later. I realized that was a lot of the kids. I wonder why I was able to stay this whole time. Yeah, yeah, so that was the young people. The strength of the young people. Why am I able to stay here? Oh, that's true. set up in his office, but whatever. He doesn't use it right now. So really, usually it's just one. One set up. And I leave it here all, all week.